Okay, good evening, everyone. I'm Bernie Hearn. I'm the Executive Director at Gondwana Choirs, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you to our webinar tonight. We have nearly 1,800 participants registered, and we warmly welcome you all from the choral community across Australia and from 27 different countries internationally. We have choral conductors, teachers, choral singers of all ages, people from youth choirs, church choirs, educational institutions, primary, secondary and tertiary, as well as our colleagues in professional and community arts organisations. We also welcome the Federal Minister for Education, Dan Tian, who I believe is tuned in tonight, welcome Minister, and hope that others also in a position to support the future of choral singing in Australia will be interested in the discussion that we have tonight. Sincere thanks to our partners at the University of New South Wales, most especially our esteemed panel members tonight, to Vice Chancellor Professor Ian Jacobs and to Sonia Maddock, the Head of Culture, Cultural Networks and Communities, who has enthusiastically shared our vision for why this event is important. Thank you. The session will be recorded and we intend to post the video by the end of this week on the Gondwana Choir's YouTube channel and Gondwana Choir's website, which is gondwana.org.au. If you wish to post a question at any time during the session, you may do so using the Q&A button, or you may also vote for questions you would particularly like to hear by clicking the thumbs up button. My colleagues will be monitoring the questions online and feeding those through to be asked if we have time. Thank you to the many, many people who sent through questions. I can assure you that we have read them all and constructed a, a framework around our discussion tonight, which tries to cover the areas most pressing to the choral community. Due to time constraints and wanting to remain focused on the topics at hand, there are a number of important issues which we will not be able to cover in the discussion tonight. In particular, questions regarding instrumental teachers and ensembles. There's some good work happening in the youth orchestra network and the professional orchestras. For an example, there are some studies in Berlin and Vienna um, orchestras recently, and several conservatories and music schools are now also creating their own guidelines for individual lessons. We expect that many of the principles discussed this evening will be relevant to other areas of music, not just choirs. Other questions received have been asking for advice on teaching online and adapting rehearsals and performances to various platforms. There are some great programs online and resources, forums, webinars by industry groups to help with this. Here in Australia, we especially recommend the Australian Society of Music Education, ASME, the Australian Music Examinations Board, the AMEB, the Australian National Choral Association, ANCA, and ABODA, the Australian Band and Orchestra Directors Association. We also recognise the positive impact on choral singing for mental health, and we've received many questions about this. We agree that there should be a separate discussion about supporting the mental health of your choristers, which we are happy to look towards next. Our goal tonight is to examine how we might safely move back into choral singing in Australia. And we will focus our questions on this discussion by examining three areas. Firstly, the current situation regarding COVID-19 in Australia. Secondly, is singing dangerous? And thirdly, mitigating the risk in the choral context. There are many variables which are important to consider when deciding when and how your choir can rehearse. This webinar is an important part of that conversation. It's not our aim to provide definitive guidelines from this one session. Our goal is to facilitate discussion, explain the science behind some of the situations we've heard about recently and provide expert advice in order for you to examine the risks and make decisions based on your own context and what applies to you. We've all come to realise this is a constantly changing situation. So much has changed, even since we confirmed the event late last week, and we would hope to reconvene again to continue the discussion. I'm also pleased to share that the Executive Director of Create New South Wales, Chris Keeley, stated today that he will work with us and the choral sector to create a framework which will provide guidelines for a safe return to rehearsals and performances in line with New South Wales Health. They will also then work with other states to share this information and to support the sector more broadly. So it's now my great pleasure to introduce the panel. From the University of New South Wales, Professor Raina McIntyre, the Principal Research Fellow and Professor of Global Biosecurity. She heads the biosecurity program at the Kirby Institute. Welcome, Raina. Also from the University of New South Wales, Professor Con Doolan, the Professor and Flow Noise Group Leader at UNSW. 
Con holds an honours degree in mechanical engineering and a PhD in aerospace engineering, and I know you are all keen to hear how his expertise can support this discussion. Welcome, Con. Thank you. Carl Crossan is a well-known and respected uh, conductor throughout Australia and also an educator, composer and clinician. Carl is artistic director and conductor of the Adelaide Chamber Singers and head of vocal, choral and conducting studies at the Elder Conservatorium of Music, University of Adelaide. Carl is a regular guest of our very own Gondwana Chorale. Welcome, Carl. Elizabeth Scott is the musical director of Vox, Sydney Philharmonia's youth choir. Elizabeth works regularly as a chorus master for the Sydney Symphony Orchestra, conducts the Sydney Conservatorium of Music Choir, where she's also currently completing a doctorate of musical arts. Welcome, Liz. And finally, Gondwana's artistic director, Lynn Williams. Since establishing the City Children's Choir in 1989, Lynn has been very busy. She has worked tirelessly and with great passion to develop our work to a national program, which now includes over 1,000 young people each year in the Sydney Children's Choir, the Gondwana National Choirs and the Gondwana Indigenous Choir. Welcome, Lynn, and let me hand over to you. Thank you very much, Bernie. And I'd like to add my welcome to everybody. I think by the number of registrations that we have here tonight, we certainly have a very passionate uh, choral community and I think a very caring choral community, which is why we're, we're all here tonight. Um, we've all got tremendous hope that very soon we'll be able to go back into our rehearsal rooms and do what we love doing most, which is to hear and experience people singing together all in the same room, much as our Zoom experiences has been fabulous. Um, it seems we've been on a great roller coaster recently. I don't know if you've been experiencing the same thing, but we've been reading all these articles and seeing webinars coming out of America, coming out of Europe. And one moment, it's all doom and gloom. We have this great enemy of these apparent aerosols, which are a great threat to us all. And the next day, it'll be that actually the, the choirs have been impacted have maybe not been doing adequate social distancing. And so we're all, you know, going in the other direction and have this great hope again. And, and it'd be great for us to be able to get the, the science around that to give us a little bit more knowledge. Um, with a view to moving into choral singing again, as soon as it seems reasonable to do so, we'd like to gain the scientific insight around when and how this might be able to safely happen. I'd like to begin by setting the scene and Raina, if I could begin with you, please, and ask you about what, you know, just basically to give us what is the current situation with the coronavirus here in Australia? And does it seem possible that, you know, it'll disappear to nothing before the, vac the vaccine comes or just tell us about where we sit right now in Australia? So we're, we've done very well in Australia. You know, the government's done a fantastic job uh, with very strong border control initially and then um, extensive testing to identify all possible cases. And, um, you know, we have very low numbers of cases, new cases each day. So it's looking pretty hopeful. Um, it depends to some extent on what happens from here on. So uh, with the resumption of... Um, social activity and um, people going back to work, whether that will um, result in any sustained outbreaks is the question. We, of course, there will be outbreaks. Um, that's, that's to be expected until we have a vaccine, but um, we don't want sustained outbreaks, so outbreaks that keep propagating through the community. We want to be able to identify them quickly and stop them. And I think we can do that. We've got the infrastructure to do that. Um, it depends to some extent on what happens with the international borders uh, because the, when you look at the WHO situation report and what's happening globally, it's actually starting to rise again, the number of cases, and we're seeing a surge in um, the Russian Federation, in um, India and um, in a lot of low-income countries. We don't actually know how much disease there is because testing it depends on how much testing you've got and your capacity to test. And um, so there could be a lot of silent transmission in some of those countries that we're not aware of. Uh, so if their borders stay closed, I think the prospect is very good. Um, I'm actually quite hopeful that we'll have a vaccine um, at least next year, if not sooner. I, I think in, to be realistic, it will be next year. The likely scenario is that 
we'll have a first vaccine candidate and then better and better vaccines after that, which is what generally happens with new vaccines. Um, but one thing to say is that the kind of effort that's going on globally to develop a vaccine is unprecedented, absolutely unprecedented. There's never, ever in history been such a massive consolidated effort. We've seen um, things like pharmaceutical companies joining forces. So we've got Sanofi and GSK working together to develop a vaccine. That's never hit, happened in my lifetime of working in vaccines for over 20 years. So. <clears throat> I think um, there is a lot of hope um, simply because of the scale of the effort to find a vaccine. That's that's tremendous to hear. Um, just leaving singing aside just for a little longer moment, what are the conditions which would minimise risk when bringing groups of 20 to 100 people together as the government mandated loosening of the restrictions is rolled out? So the physical distancing does work. Um, the further you are away, the less the risk. And, um, you know, the 1.5 metres is a very good indicator of the, um, um, the level you have to maintain that separation uh, to reduce the risk, um, but it will be reduced even more with further distancing. Um, the, the, but those rules apply to normal social interactions, which are like speaking and um, you know, occasionally maybe coughing or sneezing, and Con can speak to you a bit more about that. Um, but uh, with singing, it's clear that um, the amount of aerosols generated is much higher and for a more sustained period than from normal talking. Um, we know from research that's been done on seasonal coronaviruses that um, they can be emitted just from normal breathing. You don't even have to cough and you can find it in the aerosols. So I think the evidence is accumulating, particularly for COVID-19, that the virus does have a propensity to be airborne. Um, there was a good study that came out of the US that um, showed that it compared SARS-CoV-2 with um, SARS-1 and MERS coronavirus and the propensity to be airborne seemed to be a bit higher for COVID-19. So it's a sort of an unfortunate combination of features, that propensity for aerosolization, um, the fact that it can be spread without any symptoms. That's the most tricky part of all because, um, uh, you know, up to 20% of people, maybe 50%, depending on the circumstances, could be spreading the infection without any symptoms at all, without realising they're infected. And that's why the social dis the spatial distancing is important and wearing face masks if in uh, some countries has been recommended for the same reason. So that's pretty much all we have at this stage is the spatial distancing and the face masks, um, hand hygiene, um, personal hygiene. I note that in the report that came out in uh, Morbidity and Mortality Weekly Review on the US outbreak, um, that they speculate at the end that, well, everyone sat together and shared utensils and ate together, etc. Maybe that was, maybe it was through contact. Well, I don't think so because um, we've seen a cut two, two types of outbreaks that have really stood out. And one is the choirs and the other is um, the meat plants, meat pl packing plants. And when I looked into that, there's a high degree of aerosolization that goes on in those plants from the processes. Um, so I think, um, you know, the um, we don't know, you know, how, how they acquired it, whether it was airborne or contact, but there's been plenty of other gatherings of people that haven't resulted in as high an attack rate. I mean, the attack rates we're talking about which is a percentage of people that got sick from the total number who were there, are uh, incredibly high. The outbreak in the US, um, in the Netherlands, and also in um, in Germany, uh, you know, uh, I think about 70% 70, 70 plus people got infected, and that's much higher than you would expect. Even in a family, you would only expect 25% to get infected. So that suggests to me indirectly that it, it's aerosol spread. Thank you. So it appears that we, we've sort of attacked the, 
the elephant in the room is, does singing actually increase the risk of uh, spreading the virus? And I might pass over to you, Con, if you could explain a little bit the mechanics behind that, and then Carl will uh, delve deeper into, you know, what we can do in rehearsals to mitigate those problems. Sure, sure. So, um, so when you sing or cough or sneeze, you're, um, there's a combination of the breath uh, with the um, saliva or, or fluids in your um, in your mouth and in the in the lungs, and that gets projected out obviously out of your um, out of your mouth, and it forms like a cloud, like its own weather system. So the big drops start falling out of that cloud, and the cloud moves over, moves away from you, and eventually those drops fall away, and then you're left with an aerosol. So they're small particles. Um, maybe tiny bits of virus inside uh, small droplets or just bits of, the, of solid material. And then they can uh, stay airborne because they're so light. Uh, they can stay airborne and travel uh, uh, long distances. So um, if that interacts with say an air conditioning system or even a, a, an audience say, they're all hot people <laughs> and they are, um, they're sending up plumes of, of warm air and, <clears throat> and that, that can mix the aerosol around and, um, and spread it to, to everybody. Um, so that's in, in a nutshell, it sort of forms a weather system uh, and then uh, it forms a cloud that sort of just floats around everywhere and mixes into a room. Okay. Um, thank you, Con. I wonder um, if you could perhaps just explore um, whether the situation uh, um, for choirs might be um, any different or how different to regular social distancing guidelines. Um, for example, the distance between um, choristers um, is 1.5 metres enough? Uh, does the number of choristers per square metre matter? Does the setup of the seats matter, for example? Um, I remember um, Alan Joyce talking this morning um, when justifying Qantas's decision that uh, things would be safer because everybody was facing forward and, mm -hmm. and in choirs of course people tend not to do that we tend to be in a some, some, um, some sort of semicircle so in what ways might things be different? Well um, I guess with a choir um, that you're singing and singing quite loudly. So you'd be projecting that your breath and that, that cloud of, of droplets and aerosols uh, are along, along further away from you than um, say somebody speaking or, or even sneezing. Um, so there's that difference. Um, so if you're concerned about the people in the choir, um, well, if you people in front of other people uh, singing, well, they would be definitely in the firing line for droplets, which would, I would imagine, uh, be more uh, contagious than um, smaller pieces of, of aerosol. Um, so one, one suggestion would be to have everybody in a single line so that uh, those droplets didn't um, fall on them. But I, I guess the real problem is that aeros the aerosol, sorry, the aerosol uh, gets mixed up in the air um, and if it's inside, well, that can fill the whole volume, um, and it may may not matter where you are in the room if you fill the fill the volume with aerosol. Okay, um, you've partly answered my next question, actually, which was going to be really about um, the distance that an aerosol can mm -hmm. um, can actually travel. But um, I think what you're saying is that once it's in the room, it mixes; it's in the atmosphere. If, if it's a small enough droplet. Uh, to be suspended permanently, like an aerosol, yes, it would, it would um, you know, it would have a long time in the air. It's not to say it wouldn't settle out eventually, but it can be easily mixed by small air currents. Okay. Is the presence of air conditioning um, in the room a large factor or is it comparatively um, small? I, I would... I would think it's quite large because it's blowing air in and mixing uh, the aerosol, uh, you know, all the time. So I would imagine that. Um, but even even without the air conditioning, you you would have 
you've got a lot of people in a room and they, they're warm and they would create a plume of warm uh, gas off them. So that would create mixing in the room as well. Maybe not as vigorous as, as air conditioning, but um, that, that would also cause the aerosol mixing. Okay. Um, you've talked about the volume to an extent. Is the age and the size of a singer um, a factor? Uh, is there a difference um, in what you're saying between um, children's choirs and adult choirs, for example, let alone the conductor in the room? <laughs> yeah. um, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. I could only talk about, um, you know, mechanical mm. <laughs> things. I, I, I would imagine child would produce less, maybe not. I, I, I don't know. Uh, I, on the safety side, I'd say there'd be no difference. Okay, all right. Um, some people have asked the question, uh, does it make any difference to actually be rehearsing outside? Now, I'm not too sure how keen people would be to rehearse outside during the coming winter, but it, um, does that actually make a difference? Uh, I, w without doing tests, uh, mm -hmm. I would imagine it would, okay. because if there was a breeze, it would just take uh, a lot of that um, aerosol away. Uh, mm. and droplets away, I would imagine it would, would help quite a bit. Okay, thank you. You'd have to be very careful, of course. Um, yes, yeah, okay. Sort of blowing back on you or blowing on other people. Thanks. Um, I'd like to pass you over to Liz Scott, who's got some, um, some questions for you. Thanks, Carl. Um, I would like to move the conversation to look specifically at schools and school-aged children. The official medical advice from National Cabinet in regard to schools and school-aged students is that they are considered to be in a low-risk category. In fact, in New South Wales from Monday, schools are returning to full-time on-campus learning, a sudden leap from the current recommended one day per week. Raina, if I could uh, direct this question to you. If school-age students are indeed in a different medical category, then what advice would you give regarding the risks of choral singing in a school? So I think um, the school-age children range from sort of four years to 18 years of age. And I think there is a difference in the age groups um, based on a study that was done in Iceland where they tested kids of all ages. Um, Clearly, the kids under 10 um, are lower risk than the kids over 10. But over the age of 10, there was... Um, so they tested for antibodies, right, which is evidence of um, past infection. And in a, in a sort of population representative sample, they didn't find any infection in children under 10 or any seropositivity. Um, but they did find um, quite a bit in the kids over 10. Um, However, that doesn't necessarily mean the kids under 10 aren't getting infected. It could be that because they, there's other studies that show that people who, um, that you kind of need a rip-roaring infection to be able to mount an antibody response and develop antibodies. And if you have a very mild infection or asymptomatic infection, it's possible that some people don't um, mount an antibody response. So it, it doesn't necessarily mean they don't get infected at all. And... Um, I think, as Con said, the lung size of small children is much is less, so the ability to generate aerosols would be less just based on the lung volume. But then again, children, um, particularly the younger ones, are harder to um, enforce things like spatial distancing with. Um, so I... I think, you know, my view is that if if, we, if the kids are going back to school, risks should be minimised um, because it's not, you know, although there hasn't been a lot of evidence of um, teachers getting infected from children, there have been reports of teachers getting infected. We don't know where they got infected, but um, there have been quite a lot of reports of teachers getting infected. So I think, you know... It's sensible to mitigate the risk by avoiding crowding the kids together, whatever they're doing, whether it's, um, you know, some other activity or singing. And I, I do think there's merit in looking at the outdoor singing option, you know. Um, 
Yes, it may be possible in, in school situations. I mean, singing happens so much in classrooms um, as well as choir as an, you know, an actual um, subject or an event that a rehearsal that might happen. There's often singing you know, in classrooms, there's class music lessons, and of course, individual singing lessons and instrumental lessons. Um, so I guess you know, if people are trying to just be as careful as possible, then that could still proceed. I, I think so. I mean, the other thing is that in Australia, we've got a very low incidence of infection. So it's different from the US when there was a lot, you know, in Washington State, it was one of the hot spots for infection. So there was a lot of transmission going on in the community. So the probability of someone coming into a choir with infection was much higher, right? Whereas in Australia, that probability is lower because we've got a lot less infection. Um, so that's another factor to consider. What about um, youth community or combined schools choirs? Um, when young people are gathering together from many different schools, many of these students travel to these rehearsals by public transport. Does this actually place them, you know, using crowded public transport, does this place them at more risk than potentially the rehearsal itself? I think anything, we you know with these kind of infections and COVID-19 particularly, the more movement and mixing there is of people and in more crowded places, the greater the risk of transmission. And crowded public spaces like public transport would be a greater risk than um, open spaces or, you know, travelling just in your car. Just because there's a higher probability that someone infected has passed through there and there's so, so therefore there may be um, infectious aerosols or infection on surfaces like the railings and seats and so on that you touch and then you could contaminate yourself. Yeah. Many of our activities combine singing also with residential camps, sometimes involving people from the same region, others bringing people together from across Australia. Obviously at the moment with the borders closed, these activities are, are not possible. We're wondering when these activities might be considered safe and what will be the factors determining whether such activities can proceed? So I think, I think you have to go with your, um, your government um, advice on that. Um, in general, though, as we all know, that school camps and camps in general uh, do have an associated risk of outbreaks. Um, often it's foodborne outbreaks and gastro type outbreaks, but occasionally it's outbreaks of respiratory disease as well. Um, so again, um, bringing lots of people together from different places, congregating um, in a camp particularly. So maybe, you know, camps in summer would be safer than camps in winter where you could um, have more outdoor activity and less um, enclosed sort of time inside um, small spaces. Is it um, possible for the for choir directors, you know, organising rehearsals um, that they use the government guidelines as, you know, 10 people together, 10 people in a room, or is there a particular volume ratio that should be considered more closely for, for choral singing, you know, number of people in a particular size space? I think uh, maybe I'll ask Con to take that, that one. Um, you know, we, we've done a bit of work on the physical distancing side of things and uh, maybe he can comment. Sorry, could you just repeat that? We're just wondering if um, the reg the recommendations made by the government for the number of people in a number of people together so at the moment ten people together, um, or whether um, yeah a number of people I suppose in a particular sized room if they are singing if the government guidelines are oh. okay or if we should have more space for example. Well, um, it's hard to say. I mean, probably not. I mean, it, I mean if if the we don't really know the, the primary way it's transmitted, but if, if the aerosols are the most important, um, they're going to be mixed up. Um, and if 10 people are okay, you know, in a normal situation, will 10 people be okay singing, I would imagine, um, because, of the, you know, uh, the, the transmission path would be the same. The same for 10 people as it would be for four? Oh, well, 10, but... people, 10 people obviously would produce more aerosol um uh and uh, so presumably the, the people would ingest more aerosol um from 10 people than than with four but if the guidelines say 10 uh, i can't imagine why singing would be any different than just sitting around in a cafe or a, or a school mm -hmm. 
Okay. And what about um, duration of a rehearsal? Typically, choir rehearsals are two and a half to three hours. Mm -hmm. For example, um, is the length of the time of exposure a factor that needs to be considered? Yeah, well, I don't know the medical, um, you know, how long uh, it takes to be infected. But if, for generating aerosol, obviously, if you're singing for longer, uh, that's going to be producing more um, aerosol. So the concentration of, of aerosol particles uh, in the room will be higher the longer you sing it. And that, that would depend on another number of factors like um, how quickly it settles out and if there are any um, pathways out of the room, like air conditioning systems sometimes take air from a room or if windows are open. Um, but in general, if, there's, if you're singing longer, um, you'd be producing more aerosols. Okay. And final question from me before I hand back to Lynn. Um, Raina, in your opinion, when will it be safe? This is the big question everyone wants to know. When will it be safe to return to uh, any choral activity uh, when that activity can restart? And would you recommend a staged return to full rehearsal? So a smaller number of people first, for example. Well, I think um, it, if we come to a stage where we've had a period of time with no cases at all, no new cases, then I think you can assume it's reasonably safe. Um, but the likelihood of, of having a sustained period of time with no cases um, and before we have a vaccine is probably low. It's not impossible. We may see that. But, um, uh, yeah, I would go with a sort of um risk-based approach a probability approach based on the number of cases we're seeing in the community new cases and uh you know the incubation period is quite long it's about two weeks on average so um that means you'd want to be seeing at least one month without any new cases before you said it's safe thank you sorry uh, i'm sorry um, link can i just throw one more in i was just muted there for a sec. Just a follow-up question. Um, in, in fact, two brief ones. Um, the effectiveness of testing on choristers, um, is that a pretty good um, indicator of anything um, related here? And I've also just forgotten what my second question was, so I'll leave that one there at this stage. Oh, are you asking whether you can do screening of choristers as they come in? Uh, yeah. So I think as time goes on, we'll get better and better rapid screening tests. Um, I heard that Emirates Airlines has, has a test that they're going to test people before they board. Um, I know in the US they're working on a test that combines both the um, detection of viral antigens, the PCR, with the serology. Um, that'll give you an answer in 15 minutes or so. So... I think in time we will have those kind of tests and that, that will be a very useful thing um, for a range of different activities. Thank you. Did you have your other question, Carl, or was that? No, it has gone from my mind. <laughs> yes, I just, thank you. I just wanted to very, um, if you could tell me whether this briefly summarises very briefly uh, our discussion tonight. Um, that well, that Australia has done done well in um, controlling virus, which is such good news, and we're all absolutely thrilled that that's the case, um, and we feel in a very good position, um, and that we we have concluded that that singing does indeed emit aerosols, and that the virus is is um, carried by the aerosols. I was actually um, just moving away from our summary for a minute. I, I was interested in the, the contrasting viral loads between the droplets and the aerosols. Um, do the droplets carry more of the virus than the aerosols? Um, I'll, I'll, I'll have one, a go at that and then I'll ask Con for his view on it. But um, there's been a number of studies that suggest that um, SARS-CoV-2 preferentially infects the lower respiratory tract, so the lung, than the upper respiratory tract, the nose and the throat, and that the viral loads are higher in the lung than they are in the nose and the throat. Generally, we would think that an infection that's spread by large droplets will be one that's more prevalent in the nose and throat, and one that's more preferentially spread by aerosols will be more prevalent in the lung. 
So on that basis, um, probably the aerosols, uh, despite their smaller size, may have may be more infectious, but it's hard to say. There's no actual, no good data on that. There are data from um, both experimental and hospital studies that have shown that the virus can be detected in the air um, in one study three hours after aerosolization and another study 16 hours later. So um, that goes back to what Con said earlier, that these aerosol clouds can hover around for a long time. The other thing is the infectious dose. So some viruses, you need a, a big dose to get infected, and some you need a very small dose. Um, probably just given the way this has uh, spread around the world, um, the infectious dose is quite small, but we again, there's no good data on that. So I don't think I've really answered it, but maybe Con can um, add to that. I know Con mentioned about the size of the droplets yes. being bigger and therefore potentially more. Um, yeah, thanks, Raina. Um, well, the, the droplet, the, you know, there's droplets, larger droplets and the aerosols. So the larger droplets would contain more virus particles, I'd imagine. Um, but do they cause more infection? Uh, more infectious, just basically on a mechanical on a mechanical level, um, yeah. So, but a droplet obviously would uh, cause infection if it got into your mouth or landed on your hand and you wiped your nose or something like that. Great. We missed a little bit of what you said that it dropped oh, out. No. But I think I think we've got the general idea. Can you just just revise a little bit about the the contrast between the two, perhaps? Oh, yeah. So the droplet, you know, the larger droplets would contain a lot of virus. I would imagine, um, but they're all contained in one one package, so they would fall um, to the ground. Um, the aerosols are dispersed, um, so they would many more particles could enter your lung uh, from an aerosol. I would imagine than a droplet. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So just returning to our summary, I think uh, we concluded that Australia has currently a low infection rate, so that the risk is of carrying out rehearsals is perhaps quite a lot lower than many other countries. And that it would seem that if we were able to go for a month without, without new cases, that would actually um, give us quite a lot of confidence of uh, going, back into, going back into rehearsals, which would be terrific. Um, Bernie, I might hand back to you and to, if there are further questions from the participants. Sure. Um, thank you to everyone who has uh, sent through questions. We've been busily sorting through those tonight and I hope that people feel that the, those questions have been covered in, in various ways by our panel. Um, the last question that came through was in regards to how, how can we reduce the risk for conductors? They are at the front, they're in the firing line. Are there other practical ways that you would suggest that we could uh, investigate to, to help? protect our conductors? I mean, if the conductor doesn't have to sing, <laughs> they could wear a mask. Mm -hmm. um, I think there is good evidence that a mask uh, can help, particularly if it's got good fit around the face and is hydro, you know, water resistant material and, you know, good quality product. Um, that is something that could be considered. Terrific, thank you. Um, there are many questions in regards to specific, uh, spe specific situations, different size spaces, number of people and so on. And I think the more we follow guidelines and really look at what the advice that you've given tonight um, it will help us to draw further conclusions. If, um, as, as more information comes to hand, we'll certainly look to share that with the network. So are there any further questions from any of the, the panel members tonight? Um, I, I, I would actually quite like to ask, in, you know, I don't think we've, I feel that people might be feeling that it's, we've been a little bit inconclusive, which of course is the way it, it sort of needs to be, but we're all so much dying to get back, you know, what, what might be a timing, you know, as compared to the, the national guidelines, I think we've covered this to a degree in terms of numbers of people in a room, how do, how is singing how much is it different in terms of following those guidelines? I mean, if, if you were us, 
you know, it's like sort of saying, if your daughter was in the choir, uh, a children's choir, for instance, when would you feel confident to send your child, for instance, back into a children's choir rehearsal or, you know, uh, or, your, or your mother, perhaps, off to her community choir rehearsal? So, I mean, I think you need to be looking at, again, a risk analysis um, approach which will consider how much disease is there in the community, which will then tell you what's the probability that you'll walk into that rehearsal and get infected. Um, if, if there's very little disease and the probability is low, it's not zero, but the probability is low. Um, and then you need to think about personal risk. So if, it's, if you're somebody who's got chronic diseases, who's on drugs that are suppressing your immune system, who's had treatment for cancer or is having treatment for cancer, or um, if you've got other risk factors, if you're 50 years or over, um, then you should think about it in terms of your personal risk as well. And um, what are the consequences for you? The consequences for you may be different to someone who's 20 years old um, and gets infected. And um, I think uh, everyone will have to make their personal choices as well. But I do, I'm a firm believer that nothing is black and white and you can find workarounds and find um, ways to kind of adapt to the situation. And um, a lot of the things we've discussed uh, do, um, allow us to find workarounds um, and I think you know we're fortunate that it's not like we're not uh, we haven't got a high incidence like the US or Europe um, so it's not as great a risk here but it's still a risk it's not uh, you know there's, it's not zero risk um, I also want to mention that Con and I have a PhD student who's done a video that looks at yeah. the shows you the droplet spread from talking and singing to compare, I don't know if Con's got it and whether I've he got can... it. He, I've got it here if I can share my screen. Would that be okay? That would be great. Absolutely. Okay. So, can you see that? Yes. Yes. Okay, so this is uh, a picture of uh, a person just going through a scale, you know, do, re, mi. Uh, Etc. So it's not um, singing as vigorously as a as an, a choir singer would. So they're just um, standing in the lab. So what Pratik, our student, has done is he's developed this method of visualising the droplets uh, produced during um, uh, speaking, sneezing, coughing, etc. So he's applied it to a person going through a scale. And, and down the bottom left, you can see the notes that he's conveniently put there. And it's using um, this very intense light source that we use in supersonic wind tunnels. And we've purposed it for this um, uh, study. But anyway, I'll play it. So that's Do. You can see the droplets forming. And some notes have produced less. You can see that those droplets form some of the big ones just fall down immediately, but the, the smaller ones just fly around the room. Far's particularly bad. You can see, so, so this method picks up a lot of the droplets, but um, there's still aerosol that gets um, uh, produced as well that uh, we can't see. But a lot of these droplets are, uh, you know, they, they're staying suspended like an aerosol would. Going back down the scale. The far is particularly bad. Okay. Well. Uh, and Con, could I ask a question about that? Yes. Because it would seem that the consonant had something to bear there as well. Yes. That, the, that with far, 
it's mm. probably more the F than the, than it is the yes. vowel sound. Yeah. And the do seemed to have a different pattern depending on where it was. Exactly. Yeah. In the range. So there's obviously some other um, some other factors coming into play here as well. Oh, it's incredibly complicated uh, uh, physics that goes on. It depends how much fluid is in in your mouth, and then the way the air pushes through your mouth and shears the, the you know the, the liquid and um as it comes out it produces um you know droplets of different sizes so it really depends on how much air you're pushing out how quickly and how much fluid you have in your mouth when you do it the shape of your mouth where your tongue is uh it's incredibly complicated but i'm also wondering if potentially um and not ideal for choral directors at all but um as a start if a choir started rehearsing using humming rather than singing lots of text and kind of separating maybe speaking through text and learning their parts humming with closed mouths whether that would greatly reduce the risk well i, I think that's a great idea i think that's um yeah that would close off the uh source of the droplets and aerosol yes and i think that's backed up by what you just showed us too because mm. the ones that started with a with the m and i think this was also the case with the l from what we and from what we saw, there seemed to be less, less actually coming out of the mouth with the mm and the l. Yes, yeah, yes, yeah. I think you're right. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. And we'll never be able to sing F words starting with F ever again. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> right. Eliminated from the repertoire. <laughs> exactly. Well, I mean, maybe that's a workaround that you choose <laughs> yeah. particular pieces of music that have less of those. Um, the, the consonants or the sounds that um, cause a lot of aerosol generation. Mm. That's, that sounds like a commissioning project to me. <laughs> uh, um, this is interesting too because conductors spend, um, usually spend a lot of time um, trying to get clearer consonants from their choirs um, because it makes for better diction. So I think that di obviously diction is off the agenda now. <laughs> yes. We've had a lot of uh, requests online for people to know where they can view that video again. Um, with permission, we'd like to include that in the recording of this webinar. But if there is also an additional link or other, um, other resources that we can point our participants towards, um, we'd be grateful and we'll put that on our um, Facebook page. We can, uh, I think we can provide that video. It's very new, so there's no link to it yet, but mm -hmm. um, yeah, we can provide it. Mm -hmm. I think that student needs to know that, that he or she may be a hero. Ah, I'll tell him that. <laughs> well, maybe after he's written his thesis. <laughs> of course. Terrific. Well, I think that's just about time to wrap things up. Um, if there are no further questions from the panel, we could talk all night. We're, we're thrilled to have the expertise, Rainer and Con. Thank you so much for being part of this. And also very much thank you to Carl, to Liz and to Lynn for posing these questions and directing this discussion so beautifully tonight. Um, thank you also to the University of New South Wales. We've had around 1,430 people with us tonight online. So that's really exciting. And we're very keen for... Um, to hear what you think and to receive your feedback, please keep in touch. Everyone who's watching will be uh, sending follow-up communication about this event and, and we'd love to hear from you further. The information will be released on our website um, about upcoming activities. Whilst I have you though, we are happy to share that here at Gondwana Choirs, we are hosting some further webinars titled International Choral Insights featuring Lynn in discussion with international artists. And the first one will be on Wednesday, the 3rd of June with the wonderful international nationally renowned choral conductor, Simon Halsey, who'll discuss how he inspires and motivates choirs of all shapes and sizes. So please uh, take a look at our website, perhaps tomorrow, I believe it's, uh, there's a large amount of traffic there currently. So best to let it have a nap and come back into the website tomorrow. Um, but yes, do keep in touch and we look forward to continuing this conversation with all of our choral colleagues around Australia and around the world. So thank you very much and good night. No. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.